Hello, everyone, and welcome to CodeCast by SDL Tech Talk. We are going to bring you the content you want and need, instructional, informative, unique, and insightful commentary on programming code and technology. Coming to you live from Robots to Roadhouses, my name is JJ Hammond, and I am joined by two coding experts. Up first, he is currently a consultant with Adventure Tech in Kansas City metro area, has been developing software for over a decade, wrote his first program at age 10 in basic for DOS, served in an in the Army as a truck driver in Iraq during Desert Storm, a self-described quality freak. He now travels to conferences all over the Midwest to continue to deliver business value at speed of businesses without sacrificing the value. The amazing Lee Brandt. Say hello, Lee. I don't know who wrote that bio. <laughs> that doesn't uh, sound think, like me at all. That sounds like somebody like smart. No, it's, it's totally you, and uh, we are humbled by your presence, so uh, thank you so much for being on the show tonight. Oh, thanks for having me. However, this show would not be possible without the coolest guy I know, and quite handy, to be honest. He was working on a battery before he hopped on, striving to bring development <laughs> knowledges to the masses, and has spent the last 20 years architecting and implementing highly scalable ASP.NET applications. Our very own Gus Emery. Hello, Gus, and how are you doing tonight? Oh, I'm doing fine. Hey, JJ. Lee, thanks for joining us. It's uh, always a pleasure to talk to you. Absolutely. Absolutely great. Me too. And don't forget, everyone, you can follow us on Twitter, hashtag CodeCast, or at STL CodeCast. Also, you can find us on Facebook, forward slash STL Tech Talk, Google Plus, subscribe to our YouTube channel, subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, Windows Phone, TuneIn Radio, or listen to us live directly from our site, which is the way that you should be doing it just all the time anyways. Um, also, go to our site where you can keep up with our tech news, podcast, CodeCast, and don't forget you can interact with the show by sending us feedback to podcast at stltechtalk.com. If you're wanting to watch us live, you can ask us questions via the chat room, maybe, uh, but uh, that we're having a little bit of issue there this evening for that go. So we will be taking submissions via the email link as well as our Twitter feed or Facebook. Uh, we'll have somebody monitor that as well. So uh, without further ado, let's uh, let's go into a special thank yous go out to STL uh, Communications Inc. I actually spent today up at the St. Louis Anheuser Busch Brewery, not drinking of course because uh, it's a work day. But uh, I was enjoying several different breakout sessions on uh, new and emerging technologies and, and the different companies providing those solutions. So thank you so much for uh, uh, having us up there, allowing us to record, and Anheuser-Busch for, uh, for you know, giving us a nice space to do that. Um, we are going to uh, get this show kicked off right now with asking the very first question to Lee. What got you into development and technology, sir? Um, actually, it's mostly my dad. He was... Uh started off as an airplane mechanic and when they had had to keep track of the airplane parts they uh, needed to create a database and somehow he got sucked into doing it he also got sucked into the kind of managing the network as most people did back in in that day um, so we always had computers around my house so that he could dial in and fix problems and of course me being the, the little demon that I was I had to get yeah. into it so sure sure Got to break things so you learn yeah. how to fix it. And, of course, that, that program that I wrote when I was 10 is the same program that everybody writes in basic when they get started. It was uh, 10, print, Lee is awesome, 20, go to 10. Yeah, <laughs> that was my first program. So, But, but nice. that's the uh, most awesome program a, uh, a person ever writes, isn't it? <laughs> it right, is. it's, it's their first program. It's solid. <laughs> yeah. I told the machine what to do when it did that. Uh, yeah, exactly. Now what? Now what? Uh, Exactly. I think one thing that JJ missed actually on your on your bio is you're also uh, part of the Hallway Conversations podcast. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Uh, I well, go? I mean, uh, Phil Japixi kind of brought it up um, to a bunch of us. We'd been talking about doing a podcast for a while, and uh, he and Steve Bolin and I kind of got together, and um, we brought James Bender in a little later. Mostly it's just we were like all the really great conversations that we have at conferences kind of happen in the hallways between the sessions. And we're like, how can we make a podcast that's kind of like that where we talk about the same stuff that, that we talk about in the hallways. Mm -hmm. um, so that's how kind of Hallway Conversations was born. So we usually have a topic, um, but usually we basically just end up wandering for an, an hour or so. <laughs> well, that's the best kind of podcast, right? Because you, yeah. 
you start out and you just kind of finish wherever you find your way to. I mean, that's awesome. Hopefully that's how ours ours comes off as well. <laughs> and, but, you know, I'm glad that you could take time out of your own podcast to join ours as well. So, oh, yeah. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, tonight we're talking about MongoDB. Why don't you give me an overview of, about what MongoDB is and what it's good for? So, okay. Um, MongoDB, um, really, the big thing is the name, right? So um, it doesn't it doesn't come from Mongo-like beans. It comes from the word humongous, right? So uh, evidently Gus is old enough to get that joke. I did that at a, like a conference once, made that joke of like 40 <laughs> people... Nothing. I got crickets. I mean, I was like, everybody in the room's got to be under 30. So <clears throat> it comes from the word humongous, and it really is all about dealing with humongous amounts of data. Um, so in their design theories and their design of the database itself, um, their idea was to um, never add a feature that would sacrifice performance unless it was a really, really, really needed feature. Um, one of the biggest ones that everybody complains about is that there is no joins. Um, and that's mostly because joins are the least performant part, um, the most performant sucker of anything in a database. So that's the one thing that they leave out. Um, it's also schema-less, which is a, a misnomer. So the whole NoSQL movement has become synonymous with um, schema-less databases. Mm. And quite honestly, every database has a schema. Whether it's implied or explicit, every database has a schema. You don't just have, well, I suppose unless you're doing like real live big data stuff where you've got data coming at you um, in, from all sides in all different shapes and you have to try and do something with it. But for the most part, for applications, your database has a schema. You just imply that schema and you can break it if you need to for um, optional fields, um, things like that. So. Um, and the biggest thing about Mongo for me and kind of what got me started with MongoDB um, is I started really getting into JavaScript and Node. Um, and Node and Mongo kind of go hand in hand. Um, so it was just kind of a natural thing for me to say, hey, I want to do Node. Um, well, I guess I'm going to bring in Mongo too. Um, and I really like it for, um, we've been using it for the KCDC website for the last couple of years. And it's just absolutely phenomenal even under load. So. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but uh, would you use that for like a uh, uh, online transactional database, or is this just for a read-only style database, or what? What are the limitations there? Oh, that's um, a good question. Yeah. No, I mean they. Uh, it, it would be just fine for a transactional database, um, and we use it quite a bit for taking submissions from speakers and kind of using that as a central point of communication back and forth with the speakers. So they submit through the the form there. We also let them know that they've been selected through that, that same system and they can get back on and say yes or no, they can't make it. Um, so it, it still works really well under load. Um, the places where it really starts to fall down, I think, for um, at least from what I've seen, again, I've, I, I tend to build kind of small to medium-sized apps. I'm not building the, the super Amazon apps. So um, when we start talking about sharding and things like that, I know how to do them. Um, Sharding and replication are, are a big part of MongoDB, but I've never had to do them. Um, but uh, I think for the most part, it can handle um, that sort of scale. Where it starts to fall down is when um, you start to get into really large, um, not necessarily data sets, but uh, data documents. Um, they have like a 100, 100 node limit on the trees. I think it's something like that. Um, and I'll send you guys, there's a link to the, like, the limits of, okay. of uh, MongoDB. Um, but they have a 16 megabyte uh, limit on a document, a single document that can go into the database. Um, and if you get the 32-bit version, you might as well go ahead and lean on something sharp because there's a lot more limitations on the 32-bit version. Uh, oh, I can see that, yeah. Yeah, so uh, um, speaking of that, uh, the, the limit on a document, uh, what is exactly a document? Is that one record? Is it a set of records? Yeah, yeah it would kind of be uh, synonymous to a record in a SQL database. Um, the thing about the thing that makes it different is, say, in a SQL database, we would have like a person document and their address is over in another database or another uh, table, and we would have some sort of ID that links the two of them together. Mm. Um, and in uh, MongoDB, you could actually embed those 
um, address documents inside that person's record. Um, so that person could have a, an, an array of addresses in one of their fields. Um, and it's perfectly normal and perfectly acceptable to do that sort of thing. Yeah, and is the, does this use uh, JSON then for saving? Yeah, the, the well, it uses, it uses what's called a BSON, which is binary JSON. Okay. Um, so it takes JSON documents and um, uh, in, not encrypts them. Uh, what's the word for it? Uh, compression? Let's do like well, binary compression. Yeah. Uh, anyway, it, it uh, transforms it into a binary JSON document. Okay, that's pretty cool, actually. So, and, and, and the fact that it's written in C++, which is sometimes synonymous with more uh, mathematical processes, and, and that is kind of interesting to me. Yeah. Well, and yeah. most of the stuff that I learned about MongoDB, um, I learned from the MongoDB University. They have great free online classes that you can take if you go to university.mongodb.com. Um, they have free courses that you can take that are online and they walk you through they do exercises and quizzes and at the end you get a little certificate um, they even have a certification now for MongoDB so oh that's, that's awesome. great I'm going to have to uh, squeeze time out of my day to, to try and pay more attention <laughs> to that <laughs> you mean there's time in a day? no <laughs> No, I don't. Um, I don't so, so speaking of sharding, um, can you explain what sharding actually is? I, I think most of our, our audience knows what replication is, but sharding is kind of a new term. Yeah, so um, replication is when I'm able to take um, a database and make a copy of it, right? So mm -hmm. um, I can have like a failover for the database. Um, sharding kind of takes it one step further where I can have multiple instances or multiple machines of MongoDB instances that hold different parts of the same um, collection of documents, right? So if you think of um, a database is synonymous with a database in SQL, but then you have a collection that's kind of a synonymous with a table, and then you have a document that's synonymous with a row um, in that table. So I can take a table, basically, and say the first 300 records go on this instance, the next 300 records go on this instance, the next 300 go on this instance, and there's a sharding key, a shard key, that keeps track of who's got what data, so when you query it, it goes, oh, that's in the first 300 records based on my index, so that's over here on this machine. So sure. it's able to keep track of what machine has what chunk of, of the table. So, so you can break it way down and, and get real good scalability out of your data, then that's exactly what that's for. That's yeah, awesome. and all of all of uh, MongoDB is all about scaling out and not mm -hmm. scaling up. Okay. Um, because there's always you always run into some limit when you're talking about scaling up, right? So um, you can get to the hardware limit pretty quick um, of scaling up a database. The the servers can only take so much RAM. They can only right. take so much hard drive space. Um, they can only get so much bandwidth. So you can run out of scaling up pretty quick. But scaling out, I mean, you can always add another machine. You can always add another instance of the database. Um, so it's it's made to scale that way. That's so that's, yeah. So ahead. so does he, it uses meta, so clusters of metadata? Then I would assume to uh, to make that 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 migration possible. I would yeah. For sharding. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Basically, it has a shard database with a shard key on it um, that's stored on the main. The main server, and all the queries come through there and get handled by whatever whatever the number crunching happens on the, the individual instances. Gotcha. That's really cool. That is that actually is cool. really cool how that works. Yeah. I'd love to see how it does that in the back end. So, uh, so Lee, I think you've got a demo ready for us. Why don't you show us how it functions? Okay. Um, so what I've got is just the very basics of uh, of MongoDB. So let me see if I've got the right screen if you guys are seeing the right screen here so I've just got a little yep. terminal window here and we're going to jump into the Mongo shell um, which is kind of the the basic way to to access MongoDB um, I did find another tool today um, and I'll have to think I have to remember what the name is but it's a more of a GUI tool if you don't uh, like the command line but learn the command line and press your friends yes. so uh, um, there is actually an instance of the server running on my machine when I start up my machine um, but that's called MongoD. So if I didn't have it installed, or if I didn't have it set to start up automatically, uh, MongoD. Um, this is built for and built on kind of Unixy platforms. So you'll see a lot of this D on the end of things 
uh, for the Mongo daemon that's going to be running in the background, which is the Mongo server. The Mongo shell, you start by just typing Mongo, and you'll see it started the Mongo sh shell, um, giving me a version, and it tells me automatically that it connects to test. Um, now, I could connect to a database specifically by saying Mongo students, for instance, and it'll say automatically that's connecting to the students database. Um, now, once I'm in the Mongo shell, no matter where I'm at, I can always type show DBs, and it'll show me all the databases that I have and their database size. Um, so, <clears throat> once I once I'm in a database, it gets actually added to um, a global variable called DB. So once I say DB dot students dot find one, and this is what I do with just about any kind of database when I come into it. Um, the very first commands that I run is show DBs. Um, then I can also do show collections all the collections that are in the database that I'm currently in. Um, if I just type DB, it'll show me the database that I'm in, um, and then the show collections shows me that I have a student's collection and a system.indexes collection, which will be in just about every database. Um, that's how it keeps track of its indexes. Um, so if I wanted to find what the student's collection documents look like, I just say db.students.find1, and that takes the very first record and returns it in a nicely formatted JSON document. So we can see here that I've got um, a basic student document with a student ID that I've assigned, um, first name, last name, and then a bunch of activity, which is homework, um, some quizzes, and an exam at the end. Right? Um, the other thing you'll notice is that it has an underscore ID. Now this is something that MongoDB creates for me, and it's a BSON um, document ID. Um, so it's important to note that so if you're using this from something like um, Node or ASP.NET, um, when you get these, this string um, back from uh, some uh, API call or something, know that, know that you have to wrap it in a binary JSON uh, format before going in and querying that database. So um, we see here we're, this first student we have is Alice Baldwin, which I think is Alex Twin's sister. Um, so um, if I wanted to find just all the Baldwins, um, I could say find, and I give it a document. And basically, it's just going to do document matching. So I can say first name is, not my last name, didn't we? So we'll do last name is Baldwin. Baldwin's in the day. And you'll see, um, first of all, I got this um, JSON vomit on my screen, first of all. So it's hard to tell what all that is. And the very last thing I've got is type it for more. Um, one of the things to note about all um, queries to a Mongo database is it doesn't actually return a record set or a collection of documents. It returns a cursor. Um, so it returns a cursor to that data, um, and it automatically, in the MongoDB window here, it's going to actually output the first 20 of them. Um, and it's basically, like you see here, it's just going to spit them out to the screen. Um, so if I type it, it's actually going to iterate the cursor through the next 20 records. Um, and we can see that there's more than 40 Baldwins in this database. Just like I think there's more than 40 Baldwins acting in the world. So <clears throat> um, we don't have to type anything to get out of it because the cursor is still there and it'll eventually drop out of scope. But what we want to do um, is we want to make this a little bit more readable. Um, so what we can do is type onto the end of this, pretty, and it'll actually output it in a nice, much cleaner uh, format that we can actually read these documents. And you can see that activity here, um, this is just a regular old JSON document, um, and activity is the key, and we have an array of other documents inside of it. Um, and this is a way that you could store a person's addresses, um, a way that you could store their, um, any information that you wanted to store wholly. One of the things that I do quite a bit is I tend to store it a little bit relationally. So I might have um, score another scores collection over there where I might have an ID and any information that I might want to display when I'm displaying the student um, I'll have in this collection and use that key to get back over to the, the scores collection. Um, and you basically do it just like with any other thing else. Um, so find also, you can also do update, 
Um, and basically it's going to update the one where it finds Baldwin and it's do something like a set uh, first name equals Alec. Now one of the things to note about this is by default the update itself only updates the first record it finds. Um, so that's one thing that tripped me up quite a bit when I first started. Um, and you have to add another um, thing onto here, another argument onto here that is now it's wanting to really screw with me. Document is multi equals true. And that'll update all the ones that it finds. So um, just something to take note of. Um, and that's basically the basics of getting data out of and getting data into. Um, and the final, I guess, would be uh, db.students.ins. Lowercase. Document there. And it'll automatically assign this um, object ID for you. Now, you, it's worth noting that you can give it um, its own underscore ID. But by default, that has to be unique. So if, if it's not unique, it won't allow you to do the inserts later. The basics of MongoDB. That's pretty cool. So um, that's awesome. Yeah, you're, you're up first, Gus. Oh, I was just going to say, so what kind of scale... Uh, I, I, you've seen it under load. Have you seen this being used by... Any, uh, I mean, who else is using this, and you know, what kind of load can it actually with, uh, withstand? Okay, so one of the questions you had earlier was about using it as a transactional database. Yep. And I know that on their website, um, on the MongoDB website, they talk about MetLife actually uses it um, for their, um, what are they called, insurance salespeople sure. Sure. Um, to enter um, quotes and things like that. So um, heavy transactions, um, heavy kind of load out in the world. Um, and then I also know that Walmart is doing a lot with uh, Node, um, and I'm assuming they're using quite a bit of Mongo under the under the covers. I'm assuming, um, and I've only talked to a couple of the uh, the uh, uh, Walmart Node guys. I'm assuming they're doing a lot for number crunching. Um, Walmart's yeah. just got massive amounts of data based on what we buy and being able to figure out what to ship. So Walmart knows that if you move from uh, Minneapolis to Eden Prairie, and you're shopping at the little local, you know, your local Minneapolis store, and you move to Eden Prairie, and you start shopping there. It can tell that you've started to shop there, and to start shipping your Crest toothpaste that you buy, start shipping more units of that to Eden Prairie. Gotcha. Well, so it's a little creepy, but <laughs> yeah, well, but very accurate. Yeah. Um, Hey, yeah. hey, it's not as bad as the other the other company that sent uh, you know the teenager the uh, pre uh, pregnancy stuff. Oh yeah. With, uh, you know, <laughs> and dad's like, uh, "This is my daughter. She turned out to be pregnant." Yeah. I mean, it's uh, they, so data. Can Walmart knew that off. she was pregnant before her dad did. Yep. That exactly. Yep. Exactly. Go ahead, JJ. Sorry. No, I was just gonna say the internet knows now. No, uh, especially <laughs> how many how many Baldwin's are out there in the. Um, in the world, no. Are you are you a fan of uh, are you a fan of Stephen Wright? A uh, yeah, comedian? yeah, yeah. That's who you remind me of, and it is hilarious. <laughs> like I was laughing through that whole thing, and I was just like, "That is awesome." Um, so t tell me a little bit about um, you know, database. How 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 you moved into MongoDB to begin with? What what drove you into that? Um, I, I'm sure other people who follow you may have heard the story or whatever. I haven't, so whatever. I want to yeah. know about it. What what drove you to it? Yeah, I know. I think, again, I think it was just the, the jumping into Node. Um, for some reason, I just I started doing a little bit of Knockout with, with JavaScript and a little bit of Backbone. I think Knockout was my gateway drug into, into JavaScript, and I ended up um, just loving it. And if you'd have told me five years ago that I'd love JavaScript, I'd have told you you were crazy. But now I just I want to do it on everything. So when I start talking about uh, Node, I'm like, okay, well, I've got Node, and that's going to use JSON. Um, what databases can support JSON? Well, Mongo is kind of a natural thing, and all the Node guys use MongoDB, and all the examples I was seeing was using Mon Mongoose to connect to MongoDB, um, which is the driver for Node, or one of the drivers, and uh, it just became kind of a natural progression for me to get into Mongo. And 
it was easy to pick up the basics, but I got to tell you that that MongoDB University course um, was well worth the time. It's like 12 weeks long, but basically you get all the lectures on Monday, your homework and your quizzes are due by the next Monday, and then you just go on through it. And it was really a whole lot deeper than I thought it was going to get because they talked about replication and they showed you examples and you did replication on your machine with several instances of Node or with uh, several instances of MongoDB. And then they, you set up a shard on your local box and you, you queried that shard and you, you set up shard keys. So it was really way more in depth than I thought it was going to be for an online course that was free. Well, that's pretty cool. That is yeah. actually really cool. So uh, uh, why don't you describe just really quick um, what the interaction between Node and MongoDB is? Because I actually hadn't heard that one. Yeah, um, I, there's just a lot of, especially in the earlier days of, of MongoDB before, I think it's gotten a lot more attention lately, but um, early on, since it was free, um, that kind of perceived value, a lot of people didn't think that it was worth anything because it was free. Um, and um, the Node.js guys, I'm sure, picked it up because it was free, and it was a really decent database to just start messing with. And so there were a lot of early drivers written for um, Node to MongoDB. Um, and then they have Mongoose, which kind of enforces a schema. So in Mongoose, you create models, just objects that are going to basically kind of mimic your collections, and you just say, hey, object, save yourself, and it figures out what it needs to do on Mongo backend to actually save into the database. <clears throat> so um, that was kind of my, once I started getting into it, um, like I said, I got past the basics and was like, I really need to, to learn more about this if I'm going to start building websites with this kind of seriously. And it has really kind of taken off. I, I can't imagine, couldn't have imagined that I would see a lot of Mongo talks at, at conferences, and I'm seeing them more and more, um, even with guys like Adam Barney talking about connecting with, with to MongoDB from .NET, which I've never done before. So, Yeah, I've, I've, I've seen a little bit of that, um, and actually I've got a friend that's working with MongoDB, um, uh, you know, on a production basis, um, and they're doing it with .NET as well. So I, I just don't know how they're doing it. I don't know if there are connectors for it or what's going on. But it's kind of funny that we're talking about a semi-schema-less schema database, but yet you, Mongoose enforces schemas. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, it's like anything else. I mean, that was the first thing that kind of kept me away from Mongoose. Um, I remember going and talking to a guy, I think it was an interview a couple years ago, um, and the guy was asking me about Mongoose and if I'd ever messed with it. I was like, no, I kind of like the schemalessness of MongoDB, and I feel like Mongoose would immediately constrain me to a schema. Mm -hmm. But the schema's already there. I mean, I've already got an implied schema. I'm not going to save things to a collection all willy-nilly, right? I'm yeah. going to actually have a plan for what that data is going to look like. Um, the two biggest things in uh, MongoDB and the hardest things, I think, are schema design um, and uh, basically being able to grasp the idea that I've always said there are two types of people, two types of developers in the world. There are people that believe that the application exists solely as a data entry point for the database. Mm -hmm. And there are people that believe that the database exists only to serve the state of to save the state of the application, right? Yep. Um, and I've always been the latter. I've always been the person who believed that um, the application was the center point of what I was building, and the database was just the storage mechanism for the state of the database. Mm -hmm. um, and when you start that way, it's easy to get something like MongoDB and and, and fall in love with it because. That's basically how you design your schemas as you think about how am I going to use this data in my application. And if I think about that, then I can think about my schema. The other thing that I came across quite a bit was um, I've been doing relational databases for so long that I thought about, am, is this data really relational or am I only thinking about it that way because I've been doing relational databases so long, mm -hmm. right? So I'm trying to get out of that mindset of, thinking about data in a relational way. Um, I think most data is relational, but um, once you start going into Mongo, you're like, okay, now I'm designing this whole MongoDB just as if it were a relational database, and I have no joins. Now I'm basically losing, losing the battle. So I'm yeah. losing the one 
power that I would have gotten, and I'm designing my schema in such a way that I'm going to make MongoDB be my bottleneck for, for performance because of the way I design my database. Yeah, because uh, the, the way that Mongo works, if you had people and then people connected to addresses, you'd have to per uh, actually create some kind of a key because there is no join, right? And yes. actually do two queries to it to actually pull it back, which yeah. seems pointless instead of just inserting them into the person record and just having addresses in there and just being done, right? Yeah, and that's a constant battle. If you go out on the Internet and start searching for uh, NoSQL schema design, um, that's one of the things that you don't come across most often is to embed or to reference, right? Yeah. To, so do I embed those documents in the one document or do I make a reference to those? And I usually do a little bit of both. So, like, for KCDC, I'll have a speaker, and in that speaker, I'll have a list of sessions that they have. And in the session, I'll just have the ID and usually the title of the session because I'm going to use it that way. Yep. I'm going to display it on the screen with the speaker as a list of sessions that they're doing with a link off to that other session. So I want to have the data that I'm going to use on that screen there embedded in the document. And then when I go over to the session document, I've got a list of speakers that are presenting that topic, and it's the same thing. All I've got is their ID and usually their first name and last name, so I can display that on the screen. Uh, but then you can link out when you need to to get the rest yeah. of the stuff, which is, yeah. which is awesome because that makes total sense. Gus, right. you've had it for too long. It's my turn. That's so, turn. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so I, you know, I'm just, I'm just eating all this up. And at first, you had me. I was like, you know, because I'm a younger de de developer, and I'm thinking, okay, uh, I, you know. So, you said there's two types, and I'm, you know, I'm, you know, I'm thinking, oh my god, he's gonna say the first one because I'm, I'm in the second chart. You know, I'm, I'm with you. I'm like, uh, please God, don't let me be wrong um, <laughs> when I'm doing this because the one thing developers hate more than it, I think I well at least I do, uh, and I find other developers hate more than anything in the world. It's that when you waste your time and you realize you've wasted so much time uh, because time is so precious, and you're just like, God, yeah. if I would have just done this instead of this, I would have saved myself like a week. Uh, yeah. uh, worth of work. So um, that that was really cool uh, to check out uh, and, and just to kind of listen how you talk through uh, your thought process, right? How how you structure this? How how is this structured, and how am I going to use this? And and what is it? What does it look like? What's the bigger picture, right? Like what yeah. the comes in? Where does it go? How is it stored? And then how can I retrieve it in the most effective way possible? And I think that's another draw for me to uh, MongoDB is its efficiency. Yeah. Um, and I think and we're really going to see those going forward. Yeah, and I think if you're... One of the things that I hear a lot is, um, well, I'm going to have a database that's going to be accessed by multiple applications. Right. And I don't know that that happens all that often. Um, at least in most of the shops that I've worked in, most of the shops that I've worked in, each serious application has its own database. There may be some sort of data share or data swapping going on in an ATL process on the back end, but for the most part, each application has its own database. Um, so once you start thinking about that's not actually what you're going to be doing, Mongo starts to make a little bit more sense. Now, if you actually are going to have a centralized database and have several applications handling the same data um, in different ways, then MongoDB is probably not for you. Um, that's probably not good for that use case. Another place that I'm seeing MongoDB being used a lot is for those people who are doing event sourcing and CQRS together. Um, so um, CQRS is command query responsibility separ separation or something like that. Um, and basically what it means is that every time I'm going to tell you what to do, I'm going to separate that from all the times I query the data out of the database. And I'm going to make those responsibilities separate. And generally what you'll have is like a view of the data that is pulled to the, to the screen that looks a lot, that's shaped like what the screen is going to look like. Um, and the data on the back end may not actually be shaped that way, but there are views of that data. So when I make a command like, I want to buy this thing, it saves that command. That's event sourcing where it saves the command instead of saving the actual data or updating the data. It saves the command. And as that event loop runs, it updates the data on the back end saying, here's the order that should have happened. And that, in turn, then, then updates these views that are basically pulling straight back and forth from, from the screens. Uh, one of the places where Mongo fits really well in is that shim in between the screens, that those views that the screens are pulling from. Oh, okay. Because I can have a SQL Server database back there 
that I'm saving these events to, and those events are updating the SQL Server database, and in turn updating this MongoDB database that looks just like the screens. So that kind of, although that eventual consistency makes DBAs run for the hills. So um, <laughs> just be aware when you start talking about eventual consistency that every DBA in the room will then become a zombie and try and turn you into one too. So, <laughs> so, so try telling us a little bit about because um, I'm sure people are like, well, what's up with my SQL? Why aren't you using it? All this other? Tell, tell us a little bit about um, why to choose this this route of, of database structuring and uh, management uh, as opposed to others, other ways. Oh, you mean like other free op alternatives like Postgres yeah. or MySQL or something? Yes. Um, one of the things I think for me was the fact that being so enamored with JavaScript like I am, mm -hmm. I was really drawn to the fact that this is storing JSON documents. Um, and the fact that I build for the web probably 99.9% .9 of the time, right. um, I'm dealing in JSON documents in my application as well. So all of a sudden, there's no there's no need for a DTO anymore. I have no right. need to have some sort of transfer object that allows me to transfer that data from how the database stores it to how I'm viewing it on the front end. I can just automatically pull it right straight out of the database and say, "This is here's your JSON document. Use it." Exactly, yeah, and, and I could I could see how um I I I could see how like you said some some it's it's like a cult right like come on over come on <laughs> over because the JavaScript guys because uh, there's JavaScript and MongoDB user groups around here so um they're just like come on over it, we're 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 open come on come on let's let's show you a yeah. little bit but it's exciting you know um to to have these different options and and when we look to the different interfaces, right? How are we interacting with these databases, and how fast and fluid are those interactions? Where are some of the, um, you know, tough connection points and things of that nature? So it's it's nice learning about these different tools uh, to make yeah. this happen. Because but it's uh, interesting. One of the things I do want to mention to everyone that's out there watching, um, one of the things that I always bring up in just about every one of my talks is how many people would agree that there is no silver bullet. Every hand in the room right. goes up, and I right. say, why do we keep looking for one? All right. So immediately, I'll see MongoDB, and when I go out to these MongoDB user groups, nothing against those guys, but they're immediately telling everyone that MongoDB is the thing that will save your, save your marriage and save your job, and it'll make you a better person, and it's just not that way. It's just another tool that you can use, and it fits really well in a specific spot, um, and there are places where the relational database makes more sense. So, <clears throat> well, definitely. Um, one of the one of the things that I kind of see in this, though, is I've also seen in in the new uh, Azure, you know, web services, right, where you can just simultaneously add, you know, fields, and it just goes out and stores it. So it's almost, yeah. you know, it's it's kind of getting a likeness to this type of database as well. Um, yeah. How does this scale to Azure? Or Amazon um, Web Services, or I have not used it on Azure yet, um, but I know that there are guys out there that are using it at a much larger scale than I do, and don't have any problems with it at all. It's really odd to think about um, spinning up a Unix box or Linux box on Windows Azure, and installing Node.js and MongoDB, and running your server on an Azure instance that is serving through Apache or something. It's just really odd to think about that, but. Um, for the most part, I do a lot of hosting on Heroku because okay. it already has the stack right there, and I can just push from from Git and say, "Hey, deploy this for me," and it does. So oh, that's awesome. No, see, that's pretty cool. So, uh, the, tell us, Lee. Um, I'm going to get off of the MongoDB topic now. What do you do outside oh, of? Oh, uh, sad face. I know. <laughs> uh, party, party pooper. But uh, what do you do away from the keyboard? What are your hobbies? What What do you do? For what you know, what's your passion? Well, one of the things you well know is smoking cigars. So yeah. um, <clears throat> we've had many cigars together. Another one of my passions, well, you can't really see it on screen, but is beer. Um, so um, and you and I have shared many beers as well. Yeah. So, um, but I also play drums in a little middle-aged man rock bar, rock band here in town. Um, we play about once a quarter in a friend's basement. Um, so I love I love playing the drums. And for the most part, I, I like being involved in community. So I organized the Kansas City Developer Conference here once a year. Um, we just had it back in May and then in June of next year. Um, I also run the .NET user group here in town. 
and then the podcast, and that's pretty much all of my time. <laughs> shameless plug, shameless plug. Go to stltechtalk.com and view our event coverage of Kansas City Developer uh, Conference because we yeah. sat down with a lot of these individuals and uh, spoke to them about this. And uh, and we're going to be there again next year, but this time around we're going to have some awesome camera equipment and a whole set <laughs> and stuff like that. So uh, we, we, we've been spending some money. But it's all been on good products to, to bring uh, better content and better quality content. But you were there, obviously, and uh, we obviously have St. Louis Days of .net coming up, so we'll be, we're going to be there and, and talking to people and, and stuff like that. Um, yeah, it's I mean, uh, it's awesome that you're uh, you know I, I you find a lot of developers uh, that are musically inclined, at least the majority, aside from Gus, yeah. who yeah. can just, you know, <laughs> fix fix motorcycles, you know, they're like, that's a skill or whatever, but, um, so, uh, <laughs> so, you know, it, it's cool, you know, and it's kind of interesting to hear, finally, a drummer, because you always hear, yeah, a guitar player, you know, and this uh, keyboard, <laughs> and a drummer, I'm like, yes, yeah. finally a drummer, you know, um, <laughs> even though, even though we can program drums, just to me, watching somebody play the drums is way cooler, than uh -oh. than just it being an, a machine, just you know, going through the paces. You know what I mean? Yeah, and when you finally get a drum beat down, and all your hands and and legs are moving in the places where they're supposed to be moving, um, there's just a great feeling of I am the most coordinated person on the planet. If <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> boom, and what? Because you can drop instead of drop the mic, drop the stick, <laughs> walk away. <laughs> like try that out, mother. Yeah. You know, and because you got to keep it going. You know, I, I can't, uh, I can't do that. You know, I, I, I tried. I started off on drums, and I slowly transitioned to all stringed instruments. Because when you mess up, you can make it sound cool. When you mess up with yeah. the drums, it sounds like you smacked the cat. You know, like you, you hit <laughs> some random animal and it made some stupid sound. You're like, nope, that yeah, yeah, everybody caught that stick smacking the, yeah. the, the <laughs> drum box. So. Uh, you can't you can't make it cool, you know what I mean? Um, unless you do it over and over again, and then it's a thing. But like if it's one off, they're like, "Hey, wait a minute, I caught that," you know. Um, <laughs> and they're very unforgiving the crowd sometimes. And uh, well, these the worst part about it is, yeah. if you screw up a drum beat, you pretty much have to do it that way throughout the rest of the song. So if you want to cover so, it yeah. up, exactly. So you're like, "Oh yeah, I meant to do that." Yeah, yeah. Side, yeah, side, like clank, yeah, clank. Odd you time signatures, man. I'm just a huge Rush fan, so it's just a hard, <laughs> odd time signature. That's what that yeah. was. Oh yeah, solid, <laughs> solid. Those are the days. I was listening to some foreigner today, just <laughs> reliving the good days. But um, yeah, it, it's it's totally cool seeing that. Um, uh, you know, you're you're in the community, and and uh, uh, Gus also. Uh, you guys, you guys are are passing on that knowledge to guys like myself, uh, so that we don't make a, a, as many mistakes, right? So that we can kind of learn from your guys' mistakes. Yeah. Um, and uh, that's that's really cool. So from from all of us, thank you. Also to everybody that attends and and all these kinds of things. And you taking the time out to do this kind of stuff is is pretty amazing. So we really appreciate it. Oh no problem. I I enjoy doing this sort of stuff. So uh, especially all this time I spent learning MongoDB and making those mistakes. Um, there are definitely times when I was like, I wish somebody had told me about this three days ago before I just spent the last three days. <laughs> trying to figure it out. So um, if I can go to a conference and give a, an hour talk, I know I can't teach anybody how to really do Mongo in an hour, um, but I might, they might come across something and go, that's why it's only updating the first record because I'm not adding the multi is true. Wow. Oh, nice. See, I think about those when I'm hopping out of the shower or some random place <laughs> where I'm not in front of a computer. I'm like, God, that's it. That's it. You know, and then <laughs> always does. I, okay, I, we're gonna have to I, put you in a home early. I do my best thinking in the shower. It's where yeah. I actually think. No, 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 no. That it's it's the shower episode for sure. No, oh, um, <laughs> let it rain, let it rain. And that's that's true. I I do, and uh, just some random places. Like I'll be walking down the aisle, you know, at, at a grocery store or something. I'll be like, that's how I'm supposed to do that. Um. So, and of course, uh, the person next to you in the aisle is going, what are you talking to me for? Yeah, no, and I do. I'll totally tell them because <laughs> I'm so freaking excited that I figured it out. I'm like, hey, and it may be an employee because usually they're standing <laughs> something. You know? I'm like, hey, I found out how to do this, and all you have to do is change the – and they're just like, a colon what? I'm like, no, <laughs> never mind. Never mind. Security. i got to go home. Here, security. Take, take the card. Take the card. I'll, I'll come back. Um, yeah, I, I so find that, it takes really quite cool. noise. I actually find yeah. it takes – 
right noise. That's why I like to shower because there's that that con- that con- solid con- sound. Yeah. Yeah, I'm thinking about uh, they. I I want to you know I want to try it one day because I listen to a lot of like very, um, um, very very high flying music while I'm uh, coding because I feel it keeps my you know because I'm not on a standing desk you know I'm not cool and have a treadmill that I'm walking on and looking at or whatever. <laughs> um, when I see those guys, I'm like. You know, it's the same guys who post on Facebook. Hey, I just rode like two miles. What did you do today? I said on my ass. Yeah. I don't. You know, what do you want me to do? You know, do you want me to tell you? Yeah, I, I walked a couple of miles. Anyway, so um, hey, I 14 donuts today, man. That is an accomplishment. That too. is solid. In your, I'm gonna. <laughs> where's mine? I'm gonna tweet that. No. Um, so, uh, so yeah. So it's 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 cool to you know. Um, l- listen to all that high flying stuff, but sometimes I'm going to try it just to listen to white noise because um, I-, I think that might help when, like, working, say, in Objective C, when you just want to blow the brains out of whoever came up with that, um, or <laughs> when you are doing different stuff. But one one quick thing that I just want to throw out there is that it's um, staggering to me how many people believe that JavaScript and Java are kind of like the same thing, um, yeah. and and also a staggering number of people. Not people, but Walmart. We were talking about them earlier. Just to, real quick, Java is like one of the number one positions that I always get at. Do you know how to do Java? Oh my gosh, do you want a job? You know, so <laughs> it's like it's like there are so many. What is about what it is it what is it about the open source, the open uh, platform stuff that people are moving to that that is enticing? Like like this this database stuff and, and yeah. kind kind of walk me through that a little bit. Just what are your thoughts? Well, I on think that? I think part of it is the fact that it's so easy to get started with, right? So there's so many people. I mean, colleges teach it because they can get it for absolutely free. And um, no offense to Microsoft, but even with their educational pricing, it's they still can't compete with free. Um, and in Kansas City, it's actually kind of the exact opposite, right? So .NET is huge, and there are a few Java jobs out there, and they're still pretty in demand. But for the most part, if you're a Java or if you're a .NET guy here in Kansas City, um, you could pretty much throw a rock and hit three companies that want to hire .NET developers right now, and they'll right. take you straight out of college or straight out of, you know, some uh, boot camp training program. They don't care. Right. Um, so I think one of the things about the open source stuff is the fact that it's so approachable, right? So I can download it, and mess with it. If I can't figure it out, eh, heck with it. I'll just delete it off my machine, and it's gone and I don't have to worry about the fact that I'm not smart enough to figure this out. <laughs> uh, but there are lots of guys out there that this is the thing I think that, that got me into open source and um, I used to kind of divide my time between Windows and Linux a lot um, and mostly it was because I'd see those Linux guys on the command line typing furiously and the text going flying up the screen and I thought that guy must be brilliant. <laughs> I must be like him someday. So right. I kind of think it was the, the the novelty of the command line, and now I feel like I'm pretty decent with the command line until I get next to one of those Linux guys. So, very yeah, true. that that's that's very true. That is very yeah. true. Yeah, and, and and I definitely don't you know advocate for somebody ditching one language over the other or whatever. It's just it seems to me that the um, because they're open source and because they're they're free solutions, that that seems to be a way that businesses are looking because obviously the IT budget is now a part of the whole company's budget. A yeah. lot of, you know, different, the hybrid on-prem. Uh, that was talked about a lot today. On-prem hybrid solutions with the cloud so it rolls up into the cloud if something happens on uh, on site and just different yeah. different stuff like that and having that scalability. And, and it's interesting you said MetLife. I, our upside, when we had uh, Brad Urani on our show, um, he was talking about uh, the back end and, and MongoDB and different stuff like that. So, I mean, instead of using other uh, services. So it's just really interesting to see the different solutions that are out there for that app. Yeah, I mean, there, there are drawbacks. So um, back when I used to split my time, I was working for a company and was trying to convince them that they should use Linux for some of these other solutions. And uh, their biggest problem was if something goes wrong, they don't have anybody to blame, right? So right. if their software breaks, they can call Microsoft and... Microsoft will fix it, you know, or so they hope, right? Um, but if an open source thing breaks, you got to fix it yourself. And I kind of always saw that as a plus and not a minus. But the other thing that you get is kind of the collective intelligence of the entire world when you're working with open source software, right? So 
it's software that's not only been programmed by everybody who cares about it, but it's already been debugged by everybody who cares about it too. And there's lots of smart guys that they will run it, and it won't work for their particular application. So they'll write a patch and submit a pull request, and before you know it, it handles that situation. And now I can pick up that such that same code to handle my situation too, which I think is pretty cool. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I blame my happy mother. So. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I, I gotta say, if I saw like say you and Gus like walking out of a place, I'd be like, "Whoa, <laughs> I'm gonna watch out for those dudes smoking cigars, <laughs> maybe maybe a little bit of scotch or some whiskey, you know." Yeah. They, or that's, beer. that's trouble. That's trouble for sure. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so to not that I want to end this episode because God knows I could talk to you forever about this, but where can people find out more about what you do, what you have going on, and, and all of that? Uh, where are you most active? Uh, where can people ask you, you know, uh, JavaScript questions in the middle of the night or whatever the case may be? It's not that you're going to return that in the middle of the night, but uh, <laughs> uh, where can where can they follow you and uh, find out more information? Um, the biggest thing would be um, Twitter. I, I don't. I don't check it as often as I used to, but I still get it to my phone pretty regularly. So I'm just at Lee Brandt. Um, I think it's in my little yep. um, thing right here. So um, uh, you can also find me uh, on, and actually my bio is a little outdated because I actually work for a company called Page Technologies right now. Um, and it's actually a sub company called Page Labs where we do nothing but training and consulting. So. Um, if you wanted to find out more about this, you could get on pagelabs.com, and uh, you'll see where I'm speaking coming up. You'll also see what kind of public classes we might have coming up. And if your company needs, uh, like, on-site training, that's taken off a lot more than I would have expected. There's a lot of companies that are like, hey, we've got in Hibernate in here. We've got 18 developers, and none of them really know how to use it very well. Um, can you come in and do, like, a day training on just in Hibernate? So that has turned out to be uh, a pretty great thing as well. That's awesome. Nice. Nice. Very cool. Very cool. So uh, thank you so much, but you're not gone yet. Uh, do you have any announcements coming up? Think about that for a second. Gus, you're up with our announcements um, of the week. Sure. Announcements. Uh, upcoming shows next week, we've got Jessica Kerr coming on. I uh, think we're talking about functional programming. Uh, we'll find out later in the week, but she's a brilliant uh, person. Um, Way into data, uh, data. She loves data. Data. So yes, cool. give me the data. Um, she says. Yeah. We've so, we're the Borg. We've come for your <laughs> data and resistance. Is oh, future. she loves functional programming too. Yeah, functional programming. Yep, that's what we're actually going to talk to her about. So we'll we'll get into that too. Uh, that conference is coming up in August. Uh, looks like I'm going to be there on the twelfth. Um, uh, August 12th, and then Dev Connection September. I'll be there for the entire conference, actually. I was only going to be there for three days, but something came up, and I got business down there, so I actually have to be there for the whole week. So you guys can find me there. JJ? And we're still trying to get you in a strange loop. You know, honestly, if you just showed up and you were like, what, are you really going to try and stop <laughs> me right now? I doubt that they would. Um, so I'm going to be at Strange Loop. We're also going to be at St. Louis Days of .NET. Also, in the month of August, I'm going to be at the Microsoft offices uh, three uh, three different uh, dates, and I will uh, send everybody more information about that. But I'll be teaching um, people how to use their devices a little bit more function, you know, being able to interact with their devices a lot better. Uh, also, some coding. Um, depending on you know the crowd and what they ask for, that sort of thing, I'll kind of come prepared and all that jazz, and I'll have some more details to follow. But you're going to be seeing me a lot out there in the field, if you will. Um, also, I have another announcement. We're going to have our Windows 8 app uh, launch uh, within the next, I would say, week and a half. Uh, so very excited about that. We, we have our Windows Phone 8 app. Uh, that's currently out, then we'll have our uh, Windows 8 app, and then we're going to be working on Android and iOS and that. So uh, very cool stuff coming down the, the, the pipe. Uh, and uh, also, uh, I'm trying to think of what else, man. There was something else that was really important. Oh, I remember what it was, but then I'm not going to talk about it because I'm not a big fan of it. So <laughs> that is the list of things that I'm going to be doing, um, and that is pretty awesome. So next up, Lee, go ahead and tell us what announcements you have, sir. Um, so I'll be at Tulsa Tech Fest uh, August 15th, um, and I can't even remember what I'm talking about. Uh, beginning Node.js development, I think, is one of them. Um, 
and uh, I can't remember what the other one is. But uh, then there's uh, DevLink, uh, end of August, 27th through 29th. I'm doing a Node.js, beginning Node.js development there, as well as a talk called uh, Drinking from the Fire Hose, um, which is basically a, just about all the new and emerging stuff that's coming out that you may or may not have heard of. Um, and then HTC, um, I'm going to be speaking all three days, so I'm giving two workshops on Wednesday. Um, they're the same workshops, morning and afternoon, um, on AngularJS, and I think it's actually the whole mean stack, or maybe it's just AngularJS. Um, then I'll be talking about iOS development for the .NET developer, and uh, drinking from the fire hose, I think, again there. And then the last I'll, will be uh, App Dev Trends in December in Vegas, um, and those are the only ones I have lined up for sure right now. That's cool. Lots of speaking. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah, that is awesome. You know, and and a lot of the times, like you said, the the the, the podcast that you do. Say that one more time for everybody to hear. Oh, it's uh, called Hallway Conversations, and uh, it uh, usually the we do them on Monday nights. But uh, I think we're up to twenty one episodes now, um, and I need to talk to you guys some more about um, how to get into all of those places that you say you're in because. We did the uh, iTunes store, and we got our RSS feed, or RSS feed up, um, but you guys were talking about things that I've never heard of before, so we need to figure out how to get our podcast into those things as well. well I know we're in the Zoom music store as well. So. Oh, cool. Oh, nice. Yeah, so they rolled that on over to the, uh, the Microsoft stuff. Um, uh, the death of Zoom. Well, that could be a whole five <laughs> episodes. Um, so, uh, so... <laughs> everybody thank you so much uh, for being a part of the show again thank you Lee for being on uh, we can't thank you enough we, we oh, really appreciate it yeah. yeah always and, a pleasure to talk to you guys yeah nice. absolutely um, and uh, and and I know uh, Gus uh, Gus and you guys uh, you guys have, you have a little up on me and the whole you know bro what's up but uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll catch up I'll catch up so okay. uh, You'll catch up in St. Louis, trust me. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And we're gonna, like I said, we're gonna still, we're gonna try to get you in to, uh, to the that down here. Uh, that's what is strange loop? So straight. Well, okay. So, um, Kevin, sorry, you may have to edit this out. But strange loop is uh, essentially a developer conference that's kind of like one of those underground things. Like they sell out like within the first, I don't know, a couple of days, a couple of weeks, or whatever. And then it's really hard to get in, and it's it's kind of like St. Louis Days of .NET, only it's got w it's got way more like non not .NET stuff, yeah. you know. So it's yeah. kind of yeah. so when is conference. It? Oh, I knew you were going to say that. When is the conference? Question. So JJ doesn't know how to pay attention to details, so I'm going to look. Oh. See <laughs> Lube. <laughs> I have to laugh. I'm sorry, JJ. Oh. Uh, September September 18th through the uh, no sorry September 17th through the 19th and we're gonna tr okay. like I said we're gonna try to uh, somehow but it's gonna be at the uh, Peabody Opera House in downtown. Okay. Um, so uh, a lot of a lot of cool stuff. Um, let's see sessions. So well, if you're gonna go tell Mario Aquino I said hi. He comes and speaks at KCDC every year. He oh, introduced awesome. me to this. See, I've actually actually even got it on my desk. This room is called Zaya Room. He introduced <laughs> me to this room. <laughs> Last yep. year, or so I know that rum well. That's very good. <laughs> very, nah. very good. I knew it both in and without, um, <laughs> and it did damage both ways. Um, so, uh, again, uh, wonderful conversation, great topic. We're going to definitely have to have you back on in the future to yep. maybe dive deep into some other, uh, some of these other areas. But uh, again, so thank Absolutely. you for uh, for being on. So, um. Thank you, Gus. Uh, is there anything else you want to add to the end of this wonderful episode, sir? The only thing I wanted to do is say thanks to my buddy Lee. I'm glad you came on. Um, it was it was definitely awesome talking. I actually know a lot more about MongoDB now. Thanks Me to too. you. And yeah. uh, uh, thank you for doing all the community work that you do. Really, yep. uh, your conference mm. and everything else. You're you're a fabul fabulous human being. You know, um, that's all I got to say. Just thank stop. you so much for, Just stop. for joining us. And, and thank you for your service to our country as well. And thank you for oh, being on the show. And to all of our fans, we love and thank you for your support of the show as well. So from the entire STL Tech Talk crew, good coding, we're out.